Psalm 32. I'm going to just read the whole psalm through. So it's what's called a mass skill um, of David, we're told. So blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surround but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Well, uh, just uh, this evening, and uh, I think it's three weeks' time, I'm preaching again in a, an evening service. Uh, I just thought we'd spend a bit of time looking at Psalm 32. Um, maybe you're wondering, maybe you're not, I hope you're wondering, um, how can I best pray for those who were baptised today? What can I pray for them? How can I know practically how to pray? And I think a good answer to that question is how you can pray for people who have recently come to faith. Indeed, how you can pray for yourself, how you can pray for one another as a church, is that we wouldn't just know we were forgiven but that we would live fully and experientially in the knowledge that we have been forgiven. Uh, That is what uh, I want to sort of focus on this evening, is knowing those different things. If I'm just going to find the right page of my notes, and that would help, wouldn't it? That would be helpful. Hopefully I brought the right notebook up. I mean, we'll go without them. I mean, that might even be be better, but uh, just give me a second, because... I do want to make sure. There we go. No, that's not the ones. That's not the ones. Oh, I think I might have got the wrong notebook up. Oh, no, I haven't. There we go. That would have been fun. A no-note sermon. We do those those from time to time. Uh, They they can be quite good. But, no, I'm glad glad I've I've found these because that's that's helpful for me. Uh, Certainly, it's helpful for you. So, yeah, that we, we would be able to pray for them, to know that. And I wrote down here, this is why I wanted particularly, to, it's not particularly profound, but I wrote this down. We can be theologically accurate, but not necessarily experientially content in our Christianity. We can be theologically accurate, that's good, that's important, but not necessarily experientially content. Maybe often you think to yourself, you know, my Christian life seems very, very dry. Uh, God seems very, very far away from me. Uh, how can I know him better? How can I walk more closely with him? And actually, that's, uh, there's, there's, there's several people at the moment that are asking that question of me. Jonathan, can you help me in this? And Psalm 32, if I'm honest, is a great place to start in understanding practically how to experience the theological wonder that our transgressions have been forgiven and our sin has been covered because what we're looking for tonight is contentment and contentment is often much closer to home than you think i read a story of a a rich industrialist walking along the dock one day and he was quite disturbed to find a fisherman sitting rather lazily beside his boat And the rich man said to the fisherman, why aren't you out there fishing, earning a living? And the fisherman said, because I've caught enough fish for today. To which the rich man said, why don't you catch more fish than you need? 
The rich man asked, what, sorry, the, uh, the, the fisherman asked, what would I do with all those fish? Well, you could earn more money. And you could buy a better boat, came the impatient reply. You could go out deeper to sea and catch even more fish. You could purchase better quality nets. You could make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and you would be rich like me. The fisherman said, then what would I do? And the rich man said, well, you could sit down and enjoy life, said the rich man. To which the fisherman said, well, what exactly do you think I'm doing right now? And sometimes we kind of grasp after more riches in our Christian walk without realising we have full riches already in Jesus Christ. And we just have to open our eyes. We just have to see and enjoy. So the psalmist says, just flip over to Psalm 34, doesn't he? Same psalmist, same man. He says in 34.8 these well-known words, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what you can pray for your free baptism. Um, well, they're not candidates, and they will baptise people <laughs> um, this week. That they would taste and see that the Lord is good. And that actually, as you pray that, that you would know the sweetness and the nourishment of the Lord Jesus Christ as you partner with them uh, in that way. So, look, let's see how we can work out why this stuff is so exciting. Well, we, we know there is that sense. It's not wrong to want to be experientially content in our Christian walk. Because the first word of this psalm is that word that frequently pops up in the psalms. It's a beatitude, isn't it? Blessed. Blessed. And the idea of being blessed is more than you're just happy. It's the idea that you are deeply content to the point of enjoyment in such and such a thing or a state. So the Christian is blessed. The Christian is called to actually enjoy being a Christian. And sometimes, I guess, if we're honest, Christians don't always look like they enjoy being Christians. But actually, I hope at least in our hearts, we enjoy being Christians. I've got this hymn here to quote, It is well with my soul. Um, I'll quote one of the verses later on, I think, from that. But, you know, sometimes the glummest Christians are the most happy, aren't they? They've got that... Joy, 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 joy. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Deep down in my heart. Very deep down. But it is there. I assure you, it's there. Well, we're called to be blessed because man alive. Have you seen what has happened to us? Why are we blessed? Because our transgression is forgiven and our sin is covered. Let's just think about those two very familiar words. Two sides of the same coin, aren't they, really? Um... Uh, transgression, that idea of stepping over a line, crossing a boundary. Um, it's got behind it this idea of rebellion. A transgressor is somebody who's just downright rebellious. And um, the transgressor in Jesus is forgiven. To forgive someone means to lift up and bear away an offence. So somebody who is forgiven has had the one they have offended come along and say, I will lift and up and take away the offence that you have caused me. I'm no longer offended by you. I'm no longer offended by the thing that you've done. You're forgiven, it's done, it is forgotten. The offence is removed and we can be restored into relationship. And forgiveness is liberating, isn't it? To be forgiven, to know you are forgiven, truly forgiven, is a liberating thing. To be forgiven, though, means that we have to be honest about our sin, doesn't it? We, we can't be forgiven unless we are, first of all, ready to confess and acknowledge our wickedness and our sinfulness. We have to confess it. Look out uh, uh, down at verse 5. David says there, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. There's got to be that beginning, that start, where we actually bother to say, I am guilty, I am a sinner, and I need to uncover that. I need to uncover that truth. But transgressors are rebellious. 
Transgressors say, no one tells me what to do. You can lay down the law, you can lay down the rules, all that you want, but I am simply going to say your rules and your regulations just get in my way, therefore I'm going to break your rules. So Augustine's, there's this famous story of Augustine, isn't there, which he, he accounts in his confessions, whereby him and some mates, he's about 16 years old, I think, him and some mates decided one day that they wanted to break into an orchard, I think it was a pear orchard, and steal some pears. So they, they, they transgressed the line, they crossed the boundary into this pear orchard. And there he is munching away on pears, and suddenly it dawns on him, hang on a minute, what am I doing here? I don't even like pears. I don't, I don't even want to, to be in here. What, why am I doing it? And he goes on and he says, the reason I'm doing it is because I knew it was rebellion. I knew the rule said I shouldn't, so that made me want to do it. So I went and did it, because I'm a transgressor. And that's what it is to, to be a, a transgressor. It's basically saying, no one tells me what to do. My life, my rules, if you've been on Hope Explored, you'll know this theme is quite a prevalent theme throughout, uh, throughout the course. If you put rules in my way, I'll break the rules. The problem is that gets difficult in relationships, doesn't it? If you're married, there, there, have, there has to be some level of rule, doesn't there? I don't mean rule as in rule over, but some, some boundaries. If there's no rules, if you, you and your wife, gentlemen, just say, no, I'm going to do what I want all the time. Maybe you do that anyway, I don't know. Um, you can let me know how that's going for you. Um, if you do that, the relationship breaks down. And it's the same with God, isn't it? That's what transgressors are like. They simply say to God, well, look, I, I, your rules just get in my way, so I'm going to transgress them. And that makes us guilty, doesn't it? That means that we are guilty. And again, guilt is not a, an in vogue, fashionable kind of thing. To guilt trip somebody in the 21st century is a very bad thing to do. Don't tell me I'm guilty. Don't, don't, lay, don't lay guilt, because that makes me sh shamed. And shame and guilt, they're not things that we should... You know, you can get into trouble for shaming people and for, for guilt tripping. But the reality is we are guilty. So if, if we are Christians, our transgression has been forgiven. And then we have this wonderful idea of our sin being covered. Now, we've already thought of this idea of our sin being covered, haven't we today? Anybody remember where we've come across sin being covered? Is anyone listening this morning? On the ark, yeah. You've got this wonderful idea of a covering on the ark. Um, now, it's the same word in English, I'm afraid it's an absolutely totally different word altogether in the Hebrew, um, but it, it, it kind of lands in the English. Let, let me try and explain. Let's just go back to Noah, because um, my thoughts around Psalm 32 uh, all kind of uh, have come out of the studies and thinking I've been doing on, on Noah. So let's go back to that verse in chapter 6 of Genesis, uh, verse 14, isn't it? That talks this, this is where we, we, we read about that covering. God says to Noah, 6.14 of Genesis, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and there's the word, in English at least, cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay, so we've got this idea of a covering. Now, actually... If you've got the King James Version, this is one of the occasions where your version is better translated because I think, Caroline, have you got your, your, your ESV? Uh, no, your, your, your KJV? Yeah. What does it say? Read that verse for us. Yeah, so it's, that's it. So our ESV says cover it with pitch. Your version says pitch it with pitch, which is the correct translation. And, and I, I made that little throwaway comment this morning that, that pitch is the literal word for atonement in Hebrew. That's how that... So li literally, there, the ark is to be covered with atonement for atonement. It's a really strong, double kind of word idea that the covering is an atonement made with atonement. And that's the, that's the idea of... Now, it's an odd idea because the ark is pitched with tar, of course, some kind of sticky substance that makes the thing waterproof. And this is where this idea of a covering in Genesis 6.14 and the ark is different from the word in uh, Psalm uh, 32, verse 1. And also we read it in verse 5 as well, didn't we? I'll come back to that in a minute. Because normally, atonement, the cover, that's what atonement means. Atonement is to cover over our sin, isn't it? And usually atonement is made with blood, so for the people under the law, under the old covenant, the atonement was made with the blood of an animal. For us, atonement is made through the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the, the perfect lamb, the lamb of God, John said, who takes away the sin of the world. 
It's his blood that atones, that covers uh, our sin, uh, isn't it? And, um, and in that, that, that our sin is, is purged, isn't it? It's sort of expunged. There's a, I don't want to start kind of mixing up our theological ideas, but it's propi- there's a propitiation. It's, it's, our sin is taken, it's removed by the blood. The blood blots out our sin and our transgression so that we can now be restored into relationship with God. So if you're thinking, well, I still don't know what atonement is. Well, atonement, just spell at one meant. It's a little crude, but it's, a, it, it's helpful. Atonement brings us back into at one with God. We are restored into relationship. And that's what this covering does. It covers Noah in the ark. It atones for Noah and his family. And, and whilst everyone else is judged and destroyed, Noah remains in relationship at one with God. Now that's curious, because why, why did Noah seemingly, quote unquote, get away with it? If you're still in Genesis 6, you'll remember, because I've read it for the last two weeks, that in verse 5 it told us that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now was Noah perfect? No. No. He was wicked, just like everybody else was in that day. We have this idea, and we tend to teach our kids in Sunday school, that everyone was wicked, but somehow Noah, magically and mysteriously, was perfect. And I mean, it says that, Jonathan, doesn't it? Down in uh, in verse 9, that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. So everyone else is going around murdering each other, sleeping with each other, offering up children as sacrifices on the altar to the snake gods and all this kind of weird depravity. But somehow Noah is just kind of floating along with God. No, Noah was a wicked man. So was his wife, so was his children and their wives. But it says there, it's clear in verse 8, that Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. But that's how we're saved, isn't it? I'm a wicked man, but I'm also righteous. Well, I'm wicked because God's gifted grace to me, and he's gifted me faith that enables me to see Jesus. And I see the blood of Jesus that was shed for me that makes atonement for my sin, that brings me into relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is the door to salvation and eternal life. And so I see Jesus, his sin covers me, and that makes God, means God can look upon me, exactly as he looked upon God, as a righteous man. Not because I'm righteous, but because Jesus is righteous, what we call the imputed righteousness of God, isn't it? And that enables me to walk with God. And there's a lot in the New Testament about walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. Hey, you'll do that in Philippians. You'll come across that in Philippians chapter 1, I think. We're to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Do I do that all the time? Crumbs, I'm a paid minister. I'm, I'm a member of the clergy, aren't I? Surely I walk worthily in a, ma- in a manner worthy of the gospel all the time? Of course I don't. I yell at my wife. I, 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 I kick the cat. I haven't even got a cat. I, I get cross when the car tire when my wife punched the tire on the car which she has done um and uh, bless her um uh, when the kids just wind me up and and all of this is going on but somehow it, it, through the the, the 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 fact the reality is that my sin is covered uh, so we'll come back to that that covering now here's this i've got to keep an eye on the time because i i, I don't want to just we no, we've got right off the psalm but I, it's, we're thinking about how to experience the theological accuracy of of forgiveness aren't we i think noah on that ark experienced salvation perhaps in ways that we 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 don't really do if you think about it Uh, noah and his wife they really really got this so the door has been shut we thought about that this morning and you know, you, you can use your sanctified imagination with me a minute. The, the rain starts to come, just as God said, and Noah hears that rain, that pitter patter. Now, the creationists will tell us that it's never rained globally in the 1600 years that the world's been in, in place so far. Now, it don't, doesn't matter whether you're a creationist or not, I, I, I believe that's the route I take through the scriptures, but you, you can, we can talk about that another time. Hey, I've been to the Ark exhibition, so um, I have to be a creationist. Um, um, but, um, so, but, for the, but even if it was just, just local, the thing is, this boat is in a desert, yeah? It doesn't rain in deserts, that's what makes deserts desert. So 
you, you think about this from all the people, all the outsiders. Noah's been warning them it's going to rain. They've got a clue what he's talking about because it's never rained before. Then suddenly this stuff just starts to fall out of the sky. For everybody who's outside of the ark, this is, this is merely interesting, isn't it? This is quite intriguing. Um, you know, do they believe Noah now? Probably not. Their hearts are hard, aren't they? They're wicked. They're, they're, every intention of their heart is only evil continually. Why would they change their mind just because this wet stuff is falling out of the sky? So it's interesting. This hasn't happened before. We're in the middle of a desert. How curious that there is rain coming down. But for Noah, on the boat, with the door now shut, secure inside in the mercy of God, this must have been haunting. It's happening. It, it's coming. The, the judgment that God has promised is, is coming. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, is it 28, 27? Should know, shouldn't I? It's appointed for man once to die and then face the judgment. And we've got Robert's funeral tomorrow. We're going to cremate him in the morning and then have a Thanksgiving service for his life in the evening. And I, like any of you in this room who knew Robert and, and know Sylvia, are, are so glad that he confessed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before the door was shut. And, I, and I'll, I'm going to say this tomorrow, so I don't want to get into tomorrow's message, but I, I said to Robert when I went to see him and Sylvia last year, and he knew he was getting ill, I, I said, Robert, you tell me what to preach at your sermon, because I don't know where you stand. I don't know where you think you're going. I don't want to tell people you're in heaven and make everyone feel all warm and fuzzy inside if you don't believe that. Uh, and that's when he said to me, no, I know I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because Jesus died for me. So like, brilliant. Now we can preach the gospel at your sermon, and we can, we can preach you in heaven, uh, gazing on the Messiah. So the rain starts falling, and for Noah, this is incredibly haunting. This is incredibly strange. And then, as the rain keeps falling and the waters of the deep open up, suddenly there are huge lakes forming all around as, uh, uh, on the topography of the land. Can you imagine what it must have been like when that boat suddenly moved? Think of the noise and the creaks and the cracks as, as Noah suddenly goes man alive it it flows it, it's move it's moving and then the waters keep rising up the, the, as the waters rise it's it told us there doesn't it so the it bears up the ark and suddenly he's not on a lake anymore he's on a sea this thing is floating on its own over the face of the waters in the uncreated chaos the de sorry the decreated chaos of the flood what do you think Noah and his family were thinking? I mean, we're not told. But I, I wonder if they were thinking, what kind of moral monster is this God? You know, what kind of Old Testament God is this? This wrathful, vengeful God of the Old Testament. I mean, why would anyone want to worship him? Have, can you see all the people that are being destroyed? All the, in, quote unquote, innocent people that are being destroyed and swept away in a flood? Have you seen the little puppies and the bunny rabbits and the baby bears and all that kind of thing? They're all being destroyed. What kind of horrible God is this? Do you think that's what they're thinking? Or do you think more likely... In their hearts, they are able to say with the psalmist, blessed are we, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, because we know, we get it, we don't deserve to be on this ark. We are not on the ark because we were busy with, with religion. We're not on the ark because we're busy with perfection and, you know, the trappings of high society. We're on the ark by grace and by grace alone. And we should be in the floodwaters of judgment. But by grace we've been saved. So blessed are we because our transgression is forgiven, our sin is covered. And hey, the, we are the man who, against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Iniquity is, we'll talk about this more next time, it's that idea that we're totally bent out of shape, isn't it? Even our best works are bent right out of shape and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Noah and his family are covered by the ark. Now, the, we'll finish with this, because time's gone. 
It says here in 32 verse 1 of the psalm book, blessed is the one whose sin is covered. So this is a much less theological understanding of covering. It's a much more simple idea of covering than the covering of pitch, the pitching of pitch, the, the atonement. It simply means to cover in the way you would put a tablecloth on a table to cover the, the burn marks on your, your table. You can cover your, your scruffy, scratch, scuff, dirty wooden table with a beautiful tablecloth and everyone comes around for dinner and they're really impressed by your tablecloth. They don't know that underneath it's just completely old. The kids have wrecked it, uh, there's paint all over it, um, you know, where the kids have been banging their knives and forks, dented and bashed. All they see is the covering. And what happens is, and so verse 5 I, the psalmist says, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. Here's the thing. When we do something wrong, what we, what we do is we work really hard to cover our own iniquity, don't we? We're desperate that no one will find out. And so we work a way of covering up what we've done wrong, yeah? Made me think, and I thought, I'll ask this question. And um, we'll see how many eyes drop when I ask it. <laughs> But I wonder right now how many of you are covering up a sin, a transgression, or iniquity in your heart. I wonder how many of you are going into your situations and circumstances tomorrow morning, Monday morning, knowing that you are going to continue in a particular transgression or sin. And if the covers are removed, if the tablecloth is taken off, and your heart is revealed, and all the paint and dirt and years of filth are, are seen on that, you're, you're going to be ruined. I wonder if any of you, I wonder if I'm covering up sin in my own heart. I think it was, well, it was uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, they, they, I don't know if, it's, if he really did do this, but they, they say that Sir Arthur Conan, Arthur Conan Doyle, he wrote um, Sherlock Holmes, didn't he? He was a bit of a joker, a bit of a, bit of a prankster. And he wrote a telegram to 12 friends. And these 12 friends were some of the most socially influential people of the time. They were high morally standing members of their community, well known. And Conan Doyle wrote a telegram to them. It simply said, flee, all is revealed. And Conan Doyle was absolutely shocked to discover 24 hours later that all 12 of them had fled the country. It's like, wow, how would that be for me? How would it be for you if the covering was taken away, if that covering was removed? And yet, for the Christian, as we come in repentance and confession of our sin, God says, stop being so, stop being like Adam. Stop sewing fig leaves together to cover your guilt and your shame, that's pathetic. Let me do it for you. Let me make atonement for that. Let me, make a, let me put the tablecloth on. Let me put that back on. I acknowledge my sin, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will forgive my transgressions to the Lord, and you, you forgave the iniquity uh, of my sin. We live in a, a really weird world, don't we? Because no one really knows what's right or wrong anymore, if we're honest. Whereas perhaps years ago, they still did wrong. Of course they did. I mean, back in Noah's day, nothing's changed, Jesus said. But people know that they are wrong. Tim Keller quotes uh, in, 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 in one of his books a guy called Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka was a, a German-Jewish novelist. Weird guy. Check him out. He's got some weird ideas. Um, but actually, they're all quite profound. And Franz Kafka, Tim Keller quotes, he, he quotes Kafka. And he, Franz Kafka said, The state in which we find ourselves today is sinful, independent of guilt. The state in which we find ourselves today is sinful, independent of guilt. In other words, we all know we're messing up. Don't you dare tell me I'm guilty. It's where I started at the beginning. Is it wrong to have an affair? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But don't tell me I'm guilty if it is. And yet, if one were to have an affair, um, the, the, you come away from that, I assume, not done it, you assume feeling pretty lousy. If you lie, 
If you steal, if you cheat, or, or if you do, I don't know, think you choose your vice. Even the secularist who, who says, I know, I know it's wrong, but I'm not guilty. They still have to work out, why, why do I feel yucky inside? Where does that yuck come from? And if I'm a bloke who's married, why is it that if I'm not guilty, I still don't really want my wife to find out? I don't want my boss to find out that I've been fiddling the books. Where does that come from? What's that all about? Verse 6, Therefore let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of, the great, surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. There's some Noah stuff that we could talk about next time. So we need a hiding place from trouble. Where do, how, if I'm in sin... If I'm in unconfessed, unrepentant sin, what do I need to do? I need to hide in the cleft of the rock. You are my hiding place, the psalmist says, verse 7. Remember that he's, he knows, Psalm 51, he knows he is evil, does David. Yeah, he, he's been found out. The cover's been... Nathan came along, didn't he? And ripped that cover right off adulterous, murderous David's, David's um, covering plans. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You sur surround me uh, with shouts of deliverance. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm a Christian. I can just go and hide in Jesus and, you know, everything will be... I, I have, that has to be dealt with. Sin has to be confessed. It has to be worked out. It's difficult. It is hard... But the enjoyment of forgiveness is, again, we, we, we've run out of time. I'll get into this next time. To confess sin and to be liberated from the guilt of it and the shame of it, to be covered by God, to be innocent and righteous, not because you are innocent and righteous, but because Jesus has made you innocent and righteous. It's just such a wonderful thing, isn't it? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Because of, because of all of these different things. Let me just uh, let me just conclude this. So, either this evening, you are feeling yucky about your sin because you're not yet a Christian. You're not a, a Christian yet, and uh, you just feel wrong. You need to come and confess your sin, maybe for the first time. You need to ask the Lord God to forgive you and cover you, to not count your iniquity against you uh, any longer. You need to come into that hiding place. And if you're a Christian and you're still feeling yucky, then this evening maybe it's time to move from theological accuracy, which is important, into experiential contentment. And actually know how wonderful it is. So we go back uh, to Psalm 34. Not only does he say, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, but he goes and he says, Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Come and take refuge in Jesus this evening. Come and know rescue. Come and know covering. Come and know liberation. Come and know full and free forgiveness. And come and know the power of to overcome your sin tomorrow morning as you look to him. Because it goes on and it says in, in Psalm 35, as I've got it there, I'll, I'll read it. Oh, fear, verse 9, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Well, that sounds heavy. No, it sounds beautiful. For those who fear him have no lack. He'll give you everything you need to overcome and to know that you can enjoy walking freely, forgiven as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you can pray for Brett, Janie and Brett and Lauren that they'll enjoy their forgiveness. That's how you can pray for me. It's how you can pray for you. It's how we can pray for each other.